All right, good evening and uh, welcome to the Papillion La Vista Community Schools Board of Education meeting for January 23rd, 2023. Uh, first item, uh, call to order, a Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, roll call, please. Here. Here. Ms. Wilmar? Here. Ms. Fisher? Here. Ms. Here. Mr. Here. Thank you. And I'll make sure I uh, call to attention the open, open meetings law right there on the uh, post at the entrance to the room. And that uh, is... Takes care of call to order. Second one, communications. Uh, first up is military advisory. Doesn't look like Colonel Cooley, but uh, we'll take whoever. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening, Team Papillion. I'm Colonel Mark Howard. I'm the vice commander of the 55th Wing at Offutt Air Force Base. I've been in here one other time, so and it's, I'm glad to be back, and thanks for having us. Uh, just a couple of updates from Offit for you. Uh, we had the Undersecretary of the Air Force visit us today. Uh, she's currently at, uh, she was at Offit today and uh, Colonel Thompson, our wing commander, was hosting her. So the Undersecretary has a hypothesis that if you have no wrong door and you have a warm handoff for your victims of things like assaults and, uh, and other uh, um, family issues that could go on, and if you co-locate those helping agencies together, uh, and you have an integrated response center, you'd have a better capability for your, for your airmen and for your families on Offit. So we are a pilot test unit for her hypothesis, and uh, she came to visit us today to see how things were coming along, and she was very happy with what she saw, and so very positive visit. She also visited with the uh, brand-new four-star commander of U.S. STRATCOM, General Cotton. If you haven't met, met him yet or heard about him, he's a, he's a great guy, and uh, we're excited to have him on base. He is a Air Force guy, so we love that a lot, um, and we're excited to have him. In other news, uh, we have some upgrading, upcoming training exercises, uh, a couple of smaller events, and they build into a larger event in, in May. Um, they are uh, high, more threatening type exercises, and they could potentially affect students uh, if, if mom or dad or their caregiver is, is talking about it, and it, it, it could potentially, we, we don't anticipate that, but just wanted to prepare you for potential discussions that could happen. There's a, a smaller event, uh, 10 February, a slightly larger event, 7 uh, to 8 March, um, that we wanted to make sure we deconflicted with everybody's spring break, so we, got, we think we got that right. Um, and then the slightly larger event uh, on April 14th, and the big event that we've got coming up is our readiness exercise validation, and that's 1 May through 5 May. Um, every child's going to respond differently to mom and dad being involved in exercises or their caregiver, and so uh, we just thank the teachers and the faculty for being flexible and understanding uh, how military readiness is really critical to national security and that uh, keeping our students connected is important uh, to us. Uh, we have a couple of future events to let you know about. In April, that's the month of the military child. In July, we have uh, many of you are probably familiar with Operation Backpack, where we give out free backpacks and school supplies. That's coming up in July. And then finally, in August, we are doing a co-host air show with Lincoln Airfield. Um, the 155th Air Refueling Wing is out there, and they've uh, agreed to, to spin us back up. Since we had the flood and we had our runway closed, we, we had off a kind of in a, in a warm status. We, we forgot kind of how to do air shows a little bit. So um, they're going to help us get spun back up, and then we're going to co-host an air show. The plan is in uh, 2024 um, with them at, at Offit. So it's a good, uh, good structure for us moving forward. And I think that's all I have for us tonight, unless you had any questions. 
Colonel, thank you for being here as always. And I uh, just wanted to make a shout out to the, the good folks at Offit, uh, the weather wing in particular with the inclement weather we've had. Uh, <laughs> Colonel Dayton in particular has been really proactive about reaching out to us and giving us updates on weather Great. as it's rolling in and base closures and things of that nature. We, we one Just of, one of many things that we really appreciate about our relationship with the 55th and STRATCOM. So truly, we, pr we really value the friendship. Yes, sir. Okay. Anything else? I, uh, yeah. 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 So, so I talked to Colonel Cooley about this months ago when we were talking about the air show, and I'm, I'm excited for the air show to come yes, back, sir. you know, and everything. I ran the 2004 and 2005 air shows. I am retired. I am not. <laughs> we will not recall Oh, you, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> Two summers I will never get back. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. All right, next up, uh, we have a presentation uh, from the Elementary Clubs and Activities for Student Engagement. And there's a whole host, I think. All right. All right. Good evening, Board of Education. Uh, tonight, we have, um, for a presentation, we have the BRAP array are elementary principals um, form three array groups um, where they can uh, work together and collaborate um, and they spend time meeting and sharing ideas through the years so what you have in front of you here is the BRAP array um, and that includes Matt Hildebrand who is at Patriot Elementary Brian Ginsink who is Bell Elementary can you tell I'm going down the row? Dan <laughs> Kalp from Rumsey Elementary. Uh, John Strom from Portal Elementary. Corey Hull from Ashbury Elementary. And Pam Lowndes from Prairie Queen Elementary. And tonight they're going to talk to you a little bit about some opportunities that we have for kids at the elementary level. So I'll turn it over to them. All right. Good, good evening, Board of Education. Thanks for having us out. Uh, as the array, we are really excited to be able to share some of the fun things that um, our kids get the opportunity to be a part of in the elementary setting. Um, and community, you may not know a lot about this, but we want to make sure and um, highlight some of the opportunities that our kids have outside of the school day as well um, to pursue different passions that they might have as well as um, extra opportunities that we can't fit within the school day. So, uh, Mrs. Siri did a great job of introducing us. Uh, we are the BRAP array, and as you go down, each of the uh, buildings are highlighted. So we have Bell, Rumsey, Ashbury, Patriot, Portal, and of course, uh, Prairie Queen. So uh, we're just gonna take you through a brief overview of some of these clubs, uh, and then we're gonna let you see it through the, through the eyes of our students. Go ahead, Pam. Um, so we're gonna talk about just the benefits of clubs and what they offer our kids. Um, you may hear of and see on our video just some clubs that I think are more specific to our buildings, but district-wide there are some consistent ones that are offered across all buildings. But then um, I think what's really cool is there is some flexibility for teachers to propose a club um, and offer that in a passion area that they possess and can share with kids and enrich them. And so we kind of just talked about some of those benefits that those offer. It um, can extend the classroom, but it also can um, provide something that maybe they don't get exposure to throughout the normal school day. And so before or after school, they get a, another caring adult in the building that they can form a relationship with, meet students outside their grade level, um, and kind of just form some social emotional skills or talents that they maybe hadn't possessed before. So we just listed a few other things up there, positive connection to the school building um, that they wouldn't normally get throughout their school day, um, a passion area that they get to engage in or, or hone as a skill, and then connections with their, their peers. So there's a list of clubs. I'm going to pass it to Dan. So like Brian said, there's a lot of opportunities just within our buildings that we have here, but these club opportunities are district-wide. Um, we shared with you just a few of the names. We actually have collected as an elementary group uh, the clubs we have, and that list is extensive. There are a lot of different fun and engaging um, clubs and activities that are happening across the district. A few of them that we want to share with you, we have yearbook, 3D printing, STEAM, robotics, some drama clubs, uh, student council is one that's common. 
uh, within our student leaders that we have within our buildings. Nature Club, Girls on the Run, uh, that's actually a club that my third grade daughter was part of over at Walnut Creek, and what a great club there, so I was putting a little shout out for that. Uh, Spanish Club Broadcasting, and Battle of the Books is another opportunity that we do across the uh, district, and we have a real fun, very friendly competition, <laughs> although we do kind of talk about the trophy and bringing that home. Um, but there are just lots of opportunities across the district, and like Brian said, it is really neat just to see the passion that the teachers bring to this as well, and so much expertise um, and, and fun opportunities that we provide for our kids, engaging, and, and a lot of opportunities that will continue with them through their middle school and high school year and into their careers as they move on. So, so you're going to see a video here of our clubs, and I'll highlight a couple things after it's done. Justine Clemenger and I am the school counselor at Ashbury Elementary. I am the leader and founder of the Bionic Club, which is an after school club that I offer to fourth through sixth grade students here at Ashbury. Everyone is welcome to join. Um, and we have about 35 members right now. Our mission is to show our school community and um, even broader than that, our district community that we um, care about them and we want to make our school feel like a welcoming place for everyone. Uh, so within our club, we have some different teams. We have a welcome team, which welcomes new students to our school. We have a birthday team, which recognizes students um, on their birthdays. And we also have a um, sympathy team, which uh, when students are going through difficult things um, like losses or um, deployments or anything like that, we want to show students that we care about them um, just by sending them a, a note, letting them know that we're thinking of them and we're here for them. Learning Printing Club is a club that requires a lot of responsibility. For example, you have to be on time for every meeting the first and third Thursday of the month. Also, it's not a club to talk to your friends, it's a club to get stuff done and solve problems around the school. You have to sol you solve problems and see the er errors in what you've made and fix them to make them better than they were before. I think this club is really fun because you get to solve problems around the school and anywhere and you get to stick with that problem. I also like, would like to give a good thanks to Ms. Lowndes for letting us do this club. I teach at Patriot Elementary and I have an after school club called Pride Ensemble which is made up of fourth fifth and sixth grade students uh, where we get to sing say move play and create um, they love coming into the music room after school to jam out on different instruments and learn different songs it's such an amazing part of my day and of course we do it for the kids <laughs>
So just to say again, we are incredibly fortunate as a principal group that we get to see this happen every day in our buildings live. And it's not uncommon that I just step out of my office after the school day and I just have four, five, even six clubs running. So we get a lot of opportunities to do that. All right, as a BRAP array, we'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have for us. Yes. Um, for some of those, like the STEM ones, do any of these cost money for the kids? And if so, how do they pay for that? None of our oh, nice. clubs cost any money. And a lot of the things that are funded through our PTO or through the building or through the district. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Can I add our, our foundation? I'm really loud. Our foundation. <laughs> Our foundation also, if I can say, is very generous um, and helps support a lot of our clubs as well. Just be on the mic because then it goes oh, into I, recording. Thank you, so people Sue Ann. Can I appreciate hear it on that. The recording. Um, I want to also thank the teachers who volunteer to put on those clubs and to spend their time with the kids. I think that's a fabulous thing. Please tell them we appreciate everything they do. I really appreciate the group being here tonight. We know that athletics, extracurriculars, after school clubs, all of these things mean a great deal to our students. And for some of our students, it is the reason, frankly, uh, that motivates them to come to school every day. Uh, so we're really grateful for everything you do to build these support networks for our kids, for our families. It really is making a difference. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, one more um, <laughs> for me. I, it, like you talked about, it's so incredibly important for the kids to be motivated uh, and, and find something that they enjoy. Have you guys noticed any trends of where kids are wanting to be spending their time? Any, like, any new clubs that are popping up that you're getting kids maybe asking about or you're seeing increase in numbers in a certain type of club? You know, I can only speak on Ashbury, but um, the Bionic Club that you saw Ms. Clemenger present on, that's a whole different new club. It's, it's called Believe It or Not, I Care, and it's just letting students realize that there are other people out there that care about them, and um, there's always gonna be somebody there for them. So I think that's the one club. I was talking to Ms. Clemenger today, and um, she had mentioned 35 students. That's a third of our population in grades four through six. So at Ashbury, that particular club has really grown in the last year. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you for spelling out Bionic for me because I was going to ask that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Anybody else? Question? Comments? Really appreciate it, your time tonight. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, item C under communications here is a public comment for items not on the agenda. Uh, when called upon by, uh, by me, uh, the individual can proceed to the podium, state their name and address for the record, please. And that individual is going to have three minutes um, uh, to speak. We only have one tonight, so uh, we'll just do that, that three minutes there. Uh, and uh, Kathy, you'll have the timer for me. I appreciate it very much. And we have, like I said, one, uh, Ms. Uh, Lohan Eby. Hello, my name is Lowen Eby. I reside at 1401 Edgewater Circle, Papillion, Nebraska, 68046. My comments are related to the Papillion La Vista South High School 2021 vaccine clinics. As you are aware, I have been open and vocal about my concerns regarding the vaccine clinics the district hosted in 2021 from the standpoint of liability. I have sent emails to the Board of Education regarding my concerns and the complaint I filed with the Nebraska Health Facility Investigations Licensure Unit. I'm speaking today to provide you with documentation of my complaint, as well as the comments I intended to say on January 10th of 2022 at the school board meeting, but elected not to do so. I would like the packet to be included in the official board meeting minutes. In addition, I have a packet for each board member with a copy of the Nebraska Revised Statute 79-516 School Board Power to Indemnify Liability Insurance Purchase. 
I welcome any questions or comments you may have. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, now on to uh, item D, a uh, superintendent's report. Dr. Rickle. Thank you very much. Mr. Bailey, members of the board, uh, happy Monday, everyone. And for our members of the audience and our members of our community that are with us this evening, thank you for being here, as well as those people who are watching at home on YouTube. We always enjoy having our community stay engaged with the school district and board of education business. Um, it's been a busy couple of weeks since we started second semester. Uh, I would like to thank uh, several board members, uh, Ms. Holtmeyer, Ms. Fisher, Ms. Witt, and Mr. Madler for joining us at the Legislative Issues Conference in Lincoln today. Now that bill introduction is over, uh, we had a good recap from a variety of, of senators, including our own uh, Senator John Arch that we had lunch with. Senator Arch represents the Papillion La Vista Community Schools. He is the speaker of the unicameral. Uh, we had a good conversation with him about a number of uh, different issues. Um, I don't want to go into too much depth on the legislative stuff since uh, Mr. Gay will be here briefing the board on that a little bit later. But again, thank you for our board members for making that trip to Lincoln. Uh, time well spent. Also wanted to remind the community and the board of the community closet. Most of you are probably aware this is a, uh, an enterprise that the board has partnered with. The school district has partnered with Cavalry Shadow Lake to provide clothing and toiletry items to some of our most vulnerable families. Even though we've been operating this program for over a year now, we're doing the official uh, ribbon cutting since we're in a new location on uh, 72nd, just north of Highway 370. That is January 31st at 9 a.m. The foundation will be there since they helped provide some of the initial startup funding. Uh, but again, that's January 31st, 9 a.m., uh, 72nd, and Highway 370 in the strip mall there. Really excited about that opportunity to showcase how we're supporting our families. Uh, other things that are really fun and exciting going on around the district, we had our annual uh, Monarch and Titan girls and boys basketball games. Uh, last Saturday night, very well attended, and we have the annual Color of Hope game, which is coming up Friday at Papillion La Vista High School as they host uh, the Benson Bunnies. Uh, that benefit, that game, uh, proceeds from that game go to benefit cancer research and cancer prevention, something that unfortunately has touched most of our lives here. Uh, also had the opportunity to host our student and business advisory. The board is aware, and I believe most of our community members may be aware, we have a number of advisories that we meet with throughout the year, uh, classified staff advisory, teacher uh, advisory. They're actually meeting later this week. Uh, in the last week and a half, we've had the opportunity to meet with the business and elected official advisory, as well as our student advisory. The student advisory we actually meet with once a month. The business and elected official advisory had a great conversation around mental health. Uh, it's an issue that comes up repeatedly with our business leaders and our elected officials. And uh, Dr. Anderson briefed them on some of the innovative programs that the district is doing to support our students and families. Student advisory, we spent most of our time talking about attendance. Uh, we know coming off the pandemic that student attendance, uh, is, some of our numbers are a little bit troubling. Uh, I think those two and a half years were uh, the world looked so very different. Uh, school looked different, business looked different, our communities looked different, and I think we're, uh, we had a good conversation with our students about some ways we can uh, continue to encourage good attendance practices. Uh, also, the, as requested by the board, we do have our monthly uh, public records uh, summary. For the month of December 2023, we had three total requests. Two were submitted by Ms. Lowen Eby, one was submitted by, by Sebastian Almada, no school attorney hours were needed for any of these three requests, uh, though an aggregate number of seven hours and 20 minutes of staff time was needed to cover those three requests. No charges were made. The first four hours are free. Lastly, uh, if, if so, for those of you that can maybe see some of the uh, posters and the treats at the table, we're celebrating in a very special event this week, and that is Board Member Appreciation Week. And uh, I... I I probably sound like a broken record, but I think this bears repeating. Um, these six individuals care deeply about our schools, they care deeply about our community, and they do not get paid a dime for their time. Uh, they're one of the few, maybe the only elected officials in the state of Nebraska that receive no compensation whatsoever. And I think it's important that our community know that, that they do this because they love kids, they love families, and they love this community. They, do, they don't do it for the money or the compensation, they're doing it because of their passions. You won't find six more dedicated board members than the six people around this table. And the amount of time that they put in on behalf of our students and our families and our schools and our employees 
is staggering. It's not a 40-hour-a-week uh, job on most, uh, on most weeks, but it is a sizable investment of time, blood, sweat, and tears. So I would just like to thank each of our six board members for what you do to support our schools, support our community, and support, most of all, our children. And with that, I believe Ms. Iman's uh, uh, office has put together a brief video kind of highlighting some of the cool things that are happening in our schools. teachers. I love my classroom and I love recess and I love happy club. I like this school because I could get lots of friends. I like about school that the teachers really um, set my mind to um, helping others. I like learning, learning because it's awesome and cool. I like to learn about stuff like math and reading and writing. I like school because I get to see my teachers um, and we get to go to recess. You learn a lot of things. The teachers help me learn more stuff in math and in writing and science. I like school because it gives you a proper learning experience. I like about school is I get to see my teachers and I get to go to speech. I get to hang out with my friends, get to go to art. I like specials. My favorite specials are art, library, and PE. All the staff really care about the students. I like to go to recess. I really like the um, lunch because you just get to be right next to your friends. I like that everybody's kind. It's the best school ever. The best part is everything and everyone. I just like school. Thank you, Board of Education. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For everything you do. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Before I close up, uh, a little bit out of protocol, but could we have a round of applause for our six board members, please, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> the kids definitely said it best. Uh, and with that, Mr. Bailey, I would conclude my superintendent comments. Well, thank you very much. All right. Uh, next up, uh, board reports. I'll jump in. Um, had a liaison luncheon uh, just this week, actually, um, or end of last week, and we went to uh, Trumbull Park, and we had great conversation. I really liked the format. It was nice to have a group of teachers that were sitting in the room the entire time, and we didn't have people coming and going, so someone didn't ask a question, they maybe missed the answer, so it was really great, great to do that. We did talk about several things. I think one of the things that, um, being on the HR committee, we talked about average class size and what does that really mean because you, we all know that there's an average, but there's classes that are over, but we also know that there's classes that are under. So this district has always prided itself on trying to keep our 
class size is reasonable, but we do know that there are occasions when there's going to be a bigger class at one grade level or another, at one building or another. We also know there's going to be some that will be smaller. Um, but I do think it's something that we keep in our minds all the time, and it was great to be able to talk as a board member about how much we watch those class sizes and we talk about them all the time. Do we need to do something? What can we do differently to make that work? So that was a great conversation. Um, there was quite a bit of conversation around the a potential upcoming bond. As you know, we haven't decided for sure what we're going to have. If we're going to bring a bond issue forward, what's going to be on it? But the conversation was more around if a bond is brought forward and for some reason it doesn't pass, what happens to all those projects in that bond that many of these schools are holding near and dear to their hearts and really hoping to have accomplished? How could those maybe be accomplished in the future? Would they have to wait for another bond issue? Would some of it be able to be done through a different fund? So we had a good conversation about that. A lot of conversation about Paris, para shortage. Uh, a lot of dis conversation about what could we do differently. So that w I thought that was really a good conversation as well. Um, and we talked a little bit about new teachers and how maybe the they could look at structuring things a little bit different for new teachers on staff days so that those new teachers don't necessarily miss out on something that is really important to them. So all in all, I thought it was great conversation and great ideas. Um, many of them had some wonderful ideas and wonderful thoughts about how we could maybe look at things a little bit differently. So I don't know, Dr. Rickley, did I miss anything that was really crucial that we talked about? No, I think that's a great summary. And uh, again, just for the record, our average class size is about 19.6 19. and change. And Dr. Settles at the, at the elementary level. And uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Settles does a really terrific job of monitoring that and sharing that with the board. So yeah, yeah. great summary, Ms. Fisher. Thank you. Um, so I had a very busy first two weeks as an official sworn in board member. Um, not the snowstorm week, that was last week, gosh already. Um, the week before that I went and visited some elementary schools and then I popped into a high school. And it was just nice because I was just introducing myself and I asked for like a tour and if they had any questions or concerns and then we got to pop into some of the uh, teacher classroom, so that was kind of nice. We went into one because it was cold this day, so they were all just in their room, just reading books and playing games and stuff. And the teacher's class that I had went into, she had like her lights dimmed down, and she had those like cool lights around her room. It was just cozy, and just talking with her, and just hearing like the positives, but then concerns as well. Um, I'm glad to have that and. As I was walking through talking to the principal, he's, he asked me in a way, and it was like, so why are, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm here because I told the people that I was going to be in the buildings. I was going to be talking with principals, making relationships with staff, students, sitting in on classrooms, because I feel like as a board member, to do my best duty, that's where we need to be to help make our decisions for the staff, for the students. So he was very thankful to see me in there, and he was just saying how they don't see board members in there often, and honestly, it broke my heart. They see them during lunches, so I feel like as board members, we need to be in there. We need to be making relationships and talking with them, um, not just meeting them two years after being on the board. We should know them within our first week. Um, so I am going to plan on going back to some more couldn't go last week because of the snow day. But then I had a liaison lunch at Patriot, and Mr. Hildebrand showed me around the school before, and we were walking and talking, and it was neat to see because 15 years ago or so, I was a, a special education pair at Rumsey, so walking into the school, I was like, this looks like Rumsey. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. And then he was just showing me the stuff that, um, for like the bonds, what they're possibly going to be working on, um, it was nice to hear the teachers. I don't know how if yours was set up the same as ours, where it was us in front and then them. Yeah, so that was nice. So they shared their concerns. And I know one of them was um, the side doors with the security locks. And I had reached out, or yeah, he had reached out to me, and then we were just kind of checking up on that. But Mr. Richards was already on the ball with that <laughs> the next day. So that's awesome. Um, but yeah, so just another concern that I have, I know we're not talking about bond issues tonight, but um, walking through one of the schools, 
400 students in the in the building um, versus 400 students at Patriot just seeing the difference in the size of school um, at this other elementary school it was just jam-packed like the hallways had stuff in it there was so much storage literally almost to the ceiling which I feel like this is a this is like a need that we need like now so um, I don't know what we can do up at that about that or who I can talk to about that um, they're just running out of space and talking with him I could just see the passion that he has for his kids and his staff so I just I just really want to help him out with that um, but yeah like like dr. Rickley said I was down in Lincoln today at the legislative conference and that was fun it was, good. It was really good I missed last night's dinner because of the fog I'm not a great driver at nighttime so I turned around but miss Fisher and miss Witt went to that and they said it was nice so I enjoyed that today and I'm excited for all the bills to come thank you um speaking of the bond you and i and uh, president bailey did a tour of the two high schools regarding the bond work just so that when we are ready to start talking about bond improvements that we have an idea of the kind of changes that are going to be made there it was very informative and it was thankful again for the principals and the teachers who were there to help us uh, we went on martin luther king day so we wouldn't interrupt classes so it was it was a beautiful uh, tour by both uh, principals um, we did attend the legislative dinner um, it was uh, the the big um, presentation was from uh, Senator Brewer and Senator Justin Wayne who with five other senators from Nebraska climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in 2018 and the one thing that uh, Senator Fish uh, Wayne Fishers or Justin Fisher Justin Wayne said <laughs> He said, uh, when, when they got to the summit, his guide said, let me take your pack. I want to make sure you're successful and reach the top. And he said, that wouldn't it be wonderful if our world was made of people who would take the burden of others so they could be successful? And I was really touched by that, and I wanted to share that with everybody because he talked about it built a team, and even though uh, he and he's from North Omaha and Brewer is from little town Nebraska out in the west, they learn to get along and they come from opposite political but they learn to get along and to, to um, talk about things and to learn from each other and I think that was just a great presentation that I think we could all learn from so really enjoyable thank you uh, I also went to the legislative conference as dr. Rickley said I enjoyed uh, having the senators come speak to us what do we have like seven or eight come speak to us during the conference uh, some of them talking about their specific education related bills uh, and I know Mr. Gay is going to be going through some of them as well, but I would in, encourage the community as you guys are hearing about some of the bills and, and bringing the bills to, to voice any um, uh, concerns with them or voice your support to, you know, your state senator. Reach out to the people that are um, authoring these bills, especially as they get through their committee hearings. I mean, that's how they know um, if, what sort of support is behind it if people are reaching out or if there's objections to it. So for the community out there, there's something, especially if you see a bill that you're passionate about, reach out um, and make sure that, that you get that passion across. Uh, I also took the boys, the, the Monarchs basketball team, a week ago, last two Saturdays ago, did hanging with the Monarchs, uh, the varsity basketball team. I've got second and third uh, grade boys. Uh, so dropped them off at the basketball game with, it seemed like, at least 50 kids there. Uh, they all watched the, the varsity game together. Uh, and then after the game, the, the varsity basketball team uh, played games with them in the other gym. They ate pizza, and they sat down, and they signed autographs for the boys, and they ate it up, and they loved it. Uh, so I just want to thank the, the basketball team, the coaches, uh, for sticking around after, after a game to, to do that with the kids. They, they uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I simply had a liaison lunch uh, last week, uh, but it was great because it was, uh, I hadn't been to the early childhood uh, center uh, in a few years. Uh, it didn't seem like it was that long, but it was. Um, great conversation. Again, I do like the new format uh, of just having dedicated uh, staff uh, the entire time so we can have a really in-depth conversation on that. So um, biggest thing take away from that was um, kind of referring back, and I think they have it scheduled for this summer, but they haven't done any visioning uh, for what does 
early childhood education in our district look like uh, in, in a few years. So they're very excited uh, to talk about that. You know, what, what, what do we want it to look like in the coming years? Uh, so that's where we spent a majority of our time was you know, really brainstorming and, and then cut, keep coming back to, we're coming up with all these ideas and it was, okay, yeah, we just really need division. So uh, they have a great group, uh, small but mighty. Um, is it Head Start that got, was that correct, that moved there? Yeah, the early years. So that was uh, very good to see. It was it was fun. I, I got there right when they were transitioning from, you know, AM uh, preschool to uh, getting ready for the, the next folks coming in for afternoon preschool. So uh, to see those early childhood educators, uh, you know, firsthand was was real fun. Um, it was one of the, the biggest takeaways I took from Leadership Omaha and having conversations with the Susie Buffett Foundation. And again, just we have to continue to, to focus on early childhood education, and, and this district does it very well, and I look forward to uh, hopefully being a part of that visioning process. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just took a tour of a school, so it, or two schools. It was fantastic. No, I, I, I agree with you. Appreciate that the principals and the teachers that, that uh, showed us around. It was good to see, get a firsthand view of some of those things that we're talking about with that, with the, the potential bond issue to see, you know, what really needs to be done and everything and get their opinions on it. Um, so I, I really appreciate that uh, very much. So any other uh, board comments? All right. Uh, the next up are committee reports, uh, buildings, grounds, and finance. Uh, we have not met since the last meeting, but we do have a, me a meeting scheduled for this Thursday morning. Thank you. Human resources and student services. Uh, during the action items tonight, there will be a couple of items we had uh, at the last board meeting that were discussion. Uh, those will be voted on tonight. Then we have one under the discussion items for staffing proposals for the 23-24 uh, school year. And we will be scheduling a meeting soon, I'm told. All right. Thank you very much. And finally, curriculum and Americanism. We have not met. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, next up, uh, Section 3, Action Items. Uh, item A, Action by Consent. A motion to approve the action by consent as presented. Second. All right, thank you very much. I have a motion by Ms. Fisher and a second by Mr. Lotus. Uh, any comments? Roll call, please. Yes. Ms. Holtmeyer? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, next up, the board meeting minutes of January 9th, 2023. I'll make a motion to approve the board meeting minutes of January 9th, 2023. Second. All right, thank you very much. Uh, motion made by Mr. Madler, second by Ms. Witt. Any board comments? Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 All right. Thank you very much. All right. The next up will be the teacher negotiated contract of 2023-24 and 2024-25. Katie. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you will not see any major changes on here since we last talked other than the draft is removed from there. Um, a couple of just highlights as a reminder, this does reflect a two-year agreement with $400 being added on the base each of those two years um, with allowing vertical and horizontal movement for our staff. Uh, you'll also notice that we uh, have kept with our same insurance and um, are providing those three network choices. A couple of other of the highlights from this um, included the um, addition of granting up to 15 years for new hires as opposed to 12, um, allowing student teachers who start their careers with us in the district to begin on step two, um, adding in some uh, support for high needs and hard to fill areas, and um, a few extra duty changes, which we're excited about, like the addition of the cooperating teacher stipends for our um, veteran teachers who are helping to grow uh, the profession and um, mentoring our student teachers. Um, just again, I guess as we uh, start to wrap this up, there's 
a lot of months of hard work that go into this, and I just, again, want to recognize the PLEA team, which was wonderful to work with, very professional, and represented um, the organization very well, as well as the teachers very well, and then Ms. Fisher, uh, Mr. Lotus, and Ms. Witt for um, several months of work on this, and I really appreciate all of your extra time. I move to ratify the negotiated agreement with the Papillion La Vista Education Association for the 2023-24 and 2024-25 contract years, thereby increasing the base salary to 39400 for the 2023-24 and increasing base salary to 39800 for the 2024-25 and approving other language changes as presented. Second. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Motion by Ms. Witt, a second by Mr. Madler. Uh, board comments or questions? I want to also thank the uh, PLEA and the other members of the board who participated in the negotiation. Bears repeating, everybody did a great job. I think uh, worked well together, and um, thanks especially to Katie and her team because that also took a lot of work. <laughs> and pizza was great. Thank you. Having um, served on that committee for, for several years, many years, um, it is truly a pleasure to partner with our PLEA. Um, they bring to the table uh, a great understanding and help us to understand as well their concerns. We have great open dialogue, um, very appreciative of that ability to do so. The great work that's put in by our HR committee, it overall um, was great to see that we were able to get where we needed to go so quickly. Um, I missed that last meeting, so I, I didn't get to share in that excitement. But I, it's always exciting to me when we can come together, um, both sides, and have great conversation and come away with things that are great for our staff. So I really appreciate the efforts that everybody puts in with that. All right. If uh, no further questions or comments, uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Next up uh, is uh, item D, recognition and retention stipends. And back to you, Dr. Sanders. Thank you. Uh, this one as well, you will not see any changes since we last discussed, but I do want to share, and I'm sure some of you heard um, these comments as well, but just the, a large amount of gratitude from the staff in uh, recognizing uh, the work that they've done and the work that's yet to be done. So I, we have detailed in here and shared with staff and the Tuesday tidbits and answered questions as they've come in, some kind of frequently asked types of questions that we thought will help to um, share with them as far as how this is anticipated to look. Uh, this is $3,000 divided out um, to show both recognition and retention uh, for our staff and work toward those strategic plan goal three um, areas which focus on recruiting and retaining a highly qualified staff. Uh, simply put, we cannot do this without great people and they've been doing great things and um, I'm very excited about the potential that this would have in accomplishing both of those um, recognition of the extra work that our staff stepped up and did, as well as retaining um, the staff so that we can continue this work. Uh, it's three different times throughout 2023, so $1,000 on February 15th uh, paycheck, which would be um, for each FTE. We've also shown our staff a breakdown of this since we have people who work anywhere from one hour a day to a full-time FTE of eight hours a day. Um, those are divided out in here. So the first one being all staff that's been employed at least by September 1st of this year. Uh, the next 1,000 is May 15th for all staff who indicate that they will be returning next year. And we do those in the form of an intent to return agreement every spring and that actually follow through and do come back. And then we have the December 15th for all employees who have been employed with the district since September 1st, 2023 and or sooner. Um, and that would intend to remain uh, for the rest of the 23-24 school year. Um, I did want to add that I had the opportunity last week to attend a national um, educator shortage summit, and I think 
many of the things that we're doing here as well as uh, some of the work that we did in the negotiated agreement are, um, I think they're bold and I think they are going to achieve the types of things that we're looking to achieve in this profession. So, but I'll entertain if there's any questions before the recommendation to approve. Um, for this money, can you tell, where did this money come come from again? I forget. Right, so this is money that we had budgeted for to be able to use for things like filling all para positions, um, transportation during the closure time, uh, a large variety of things, but primarily a lot of this did come from unfilled types of positions that we had previously budgeted for. Um, and I would say we're cautious about making sure that we saved as we looked to see what could happen in those um, during the pandemic time as well as the time immediately following. Uh, so this is truly um, money that was unspent from those, which would make be the reason why um, we wanted to be clear that these are a one-time type of decision. Um, how, how come we waited till like now since we've had the money? Why didn't we do it sooner? Yeah, so one of the things that we aimed to do was plan appropriately what are some of the costs that we anticipated would be rising that we knew would probably need to dip into some of those funds. Um, but also we did ask the staff knowing that we were our teachers are our biggest group and knowing that we were going into uh, the negotiations time, uh, we asked please be patient as we want to make sure that we can do. Um, the goal of our subcommittee was, you know, what can we do that's the very um, best in the agreement and then look to other solutions as well. Any other questions? I'll make the motion to approve the one-year recognition and retention stipend in the total of about uh, a total amount of three thousand dollars for each full-time FTE per the specified language. Second. All right, thank you. Uh, motion by Ms. Witt, uh, second by Ms. Fisher. Any final comments or questions? All right, roll call, please. Ms. Yes. 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 All right, thank you very much. Uh, item E under the action items is the uh, PLHS and La Vista Middle Schools kitchen freezers. Uh, Mr. Richards. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mealy. <clears throat> we did have two bids come in for these uh, projects that I talked about uh, at the last meeting. Um, and one of them came in uh, below our architect's estimates, which was good to see. Uh, some of these smaller projects, construction-wise, uh, we don't tend to get a lot of contractors that, that do put in for these types of projects because they are smaller. Um, and we'll take up a lot of the summer here for that, that particular team. Uh, but we're appreciative of, of the two that did put in. And we felt like we got a really good one from Elkhorn West Construction. Um, of the $630,300 that was their bid, 80% uh, of that is for the equipment. So... As you, or an estimated 80% of that is for the equipment um, so for both of those freezers. Those are your walk-in freezers. They do have to be constructed. Uh, the other 20% is construction costs as a part of that. Um, that 80% will come out of the school lunch fund. So the school lunch fund does allow us to use that uh, money, which is mostly from financial federal uh, dollars during the pandemic uh, that came in uh, and bolstered that particular fund. So we're happy to be able to put that to use within this uh, uh, these two freezer projects, uh, those two schools. Um, BCDM architects did verify uh, with the construction company that they are able and ready to um, stand by that bid and, and get that completed over the summer. And I'll be happy to, well, let me, let me say no, we aren't going to look at that alternate at this particular time. That was the flooring in the kitchen at, the, at Monarch, and uh, we just don't feel like we can get that done in the time allotted. And our floor up there is still pretty in decent shape. Those quarry tile floors last forever. Uh, they really do. And um, so we're willing to kind of clean that up and, and uh, get it polished instead of replacing it at this particular time so it doesn't include the alternate. Um, quick question. Quite a difference in the bids that we received in terms yeah. of a monetary uh, difference there. Mm -hmm. um, have we worked with Elkhorn West Construction before for something, for um, some project? 
I do believe there was one construction project that Elkhorn West did in the past. I'll, I'll follow up on that again. That from architects, I remember them saying that. But they do have work for other school districts. Mm -hmm. um, and BCDM feels very confident in their ability to get this project done. So no concern about that wide range in the two mm -hmm. gates. Okay, thank you. Yeah, typically, you know, the smaller construction companies uh, have a lot less overhead and can get these projects done a little bit cheaper. Uh, so we kind of encourage some of those to get involved in these types of projects, and that helps us out as a district, typically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve one, Elkhorn West Construction to complete kitchen freezer projects at Papillion La Vista High School and La Vista Middle School as designed and bid in the project for the amount of $633,300. $630,300. Two, delegates authority to and authorizes, approves and directs the President of the Board of Education, Superintendent of Schools, Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, or as designee for the school district to sign, execute, and deliver such construction contract, sign and approve any change or orders, increases or decreases, retain necessary professionals for assistance, and approve any expenses related to the construction project and the site preparation work, and take all other action necessary to complete any requirements or obligations under the construction project and contract. Second. Thank you very much. Probably the longest motion I think I've seen in three years. Uh, motion by Mr. Lotus, second by Mr. Madler. Any further questions or comments? Then roll call, please. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ms. Holtmeyer? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Mr. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. All right. That concludes uh, Section 3 action items. Uh, on to Section 4, discussion and information items. First up, a legislative update uh, from Catalyst Public Affairs. Mr. Gay. Thank, thank you uh, for spending a little time. Tim Gay with Catalyst Public Affairs. Um, first of all, I, I didn't know I'd be giving a presentation right after you got done with the school boards, so we'll see how I do. <laughs> but anyway, I know you went to the school board's uh, legislative hearing today. They do a great job. Uh, what we just handed out is what's online as well, and but I figured it's good. I'm an old guy. I like to see things and I can write on them and do whatever. But that's 53 pages front and back of bills. Those are going to be a little more in-depth than what you probably heard today, which I think is good. So we cross-reference all the bills, all the bills that are introduced with the statutes that exist, and kind of pick and choose. Well, we don't pick and choose. We take from the bill what's in that bill. So you'll have a little better understanding of, of what's in those bills when we get to them. Um, my goal tonight is... Uh, there were 800 bills introduced, and those are about 95 bills referenced to education. So what we're trying to do is, on your legislative priorities that we talked to, Dr. Rickley and Brett, we kind of stick to that. You know, we look at funding, school safety, um, predictable revenue streams that come in, and we'll talk about revenues going forward, local control and educational matters and curriculum. And then also uh, different uh, state funding retention is a big issue this year, as Dr. Settles knows, retention of teachers. So what I wanted to do is kind of give you an overview of where we're at, where we're going. So today is day 13, as you know, of a 90-day session. If my math is correct, that's about where 15% of the way through the hearings of 812 bills were introduced. And, um, oh gosh, I think like 20 constitutional amendments. So... That's what we've been going through. 400 of those bills were introduced on day 9 and 10, so the last two days where you can introduce bills. So we're just absolutely swamped last week with bills, trying to read them and, and get that prepared for you. So ask for, I'll ask for a little grace. I, have, you know, I don't know all the details of all these bills tonight. We can get to them, and we're gonna, we will as we go through there and kind of just say, um, here's what we're following as they schedule them. 
So uh, Senator Merman was elected chair of the committee of the education committee. That's a new chairperson. Lynn Walls was the chair before. Uh, she's still on the committee, but she got defeated on the first day of the legislature. So Senator Merman is now uh, the chairman. For us, the committee, um, it's a different makeup this year. One of the things we did lose, Senator Day, who is our senator and a graduate of Papillion La Vista, is no longer on the committee. Senator Sanders still is, and she's on the committee. And she's also on the uh, governor's committee to look at different funding issues and things like that. So we're still we're well doing well on that committee. There's several new ones, like, say, Daniel Conrad coming back. Um, Justin Wayne is new to the committee. And I think that's it so far. So that's kind of where we're, are, where we're at. The Revenue Committee has some changes and things as well, so we will look at that. But like I say, of those 95 bills, uh, what I want to do is kind of talk about, I'll get mine ready here, but just talk about the different bills that are happening. So the governor, as you know, has put kids and taxes are the two big things going on right now. So his kids' bills or school funding, things like that, he's got three bills that you want to mark, and you could probably just jot these down, too, because I don't know if we'd get into all of them. But anyway, LB 583 is the TOSA bill uh, that Senator Sanders introduced on behalf of the governor. That, that makes a lot of different changes uh, that you're going to see uh, in TOSA. Senator six, LB 681 by Senator Clements was introduced. That's the one that creates the um, kind of the annuity or the trust fund or whatever you want to call it. Uh, of 2.5 billion, 1 billion right away, and then adding to that fund later. That would then fund his idea of $1,500 to each child. Every child gets it, get everyone, you know, involved in the, in the program. People have not had a look at that. I think Wednesday, the governor's given his state of the state budget address. So people, I'm just starting to see, and you will too, how the fiscally, how that really works because there's a lot of ideas out there. But that's a huge one, and Senator Clements is, of course, familiar with Sarpy County. That's a good thing. He, he will understand what we're, what we're bringing to him when we talk to him. There's LB 589, which also does some funding. It's a funding cap by Senator Breezy. So if they're going to put that kind of money into the school district, um, I forget the term they're using, but they call it necessary spending limits or something like that. Um, but there's a, there's a term they're using, and what that is is LIDS. Um, and that's just the way it is. If they're going to put that kind of money in the school system, they're going to require some kind of fiscal restraint. There will be issues where you could override that with a majority of the school board or a public vote. The public vote would have to be at 60%. And all these are just what the bills are introduced as. They could change, of course, a million times. But, but that's a huge huge deal um, for you in a growing district. And also, sometimes when we look at the caps on spending, you're always lagging a year behind, kind of. So you get the students to come in, and a little bit how that would work out, you're, you're going to be behind. So if you get a lot of students compared to the people who aren't having the kind of growth you have, that could be an issue. But those things are the things we're going to work out, I suppose. Um, the different bills that, that we're kind of seeing, different generalizations would be um, there's a lot of the same bills that have been, have been reintroduced. Um, I jotted down a few of those, um, but I won't go in particular order, but Senator Albright introduced a bill, LB 637, you might want to look at. That's Open Meetings Act and, and public participation and some of those things that are important to everybody. Uh, that's a bill that's out there for, and this is for all um, public entities, not just school districts. It's for everybody would get a chance to, to visit. Uh, she has another bill that has been reintroduced several times, uh, uh, Senator Albright. It's a K-12 Cyber Security Act. They look at that, and it's kind of like what can you access on the school's laptops, at the library, different things. The pushback on that has been a lot of the telecommunication companies or Internet providers, things like that. They get a little skittish when people are starting to restrain what can be said and how do you control what people are seeing online. So that's a big one. Senator Bo Ballard introduced LB 550. It's an option enrollment expansion, and you get taxes. You can get a tax credit for the kids that want to do option enrollment, and it has different ways that you can option enrollment 
and so how are you going to do it? But I, I need to take a harder look at that. Sir Blood had a nice bill um, that we've kind of watched last year. What it is, it's an unfunded mandate bill. It's a constitutional amendment, actually. She didn't go very far last year. She prioritized it, got on general file, and didn't get past that. But what that does is any unfunded mandate they would give you, that the state would have to pay for it. So a lot of times they're putting these bills out there. They all sound good, but you have to pay for them. And like I say, when you have 100 of the 800 bills that are education funded, and there's probably a few I'm missing here too, that that's pretty serious. You know, that's a lot of telling you what to do without paying for it on a lot of these things. They may seem small at the time, but they really add up over the course of time of people putting time into it to follow these bills. But anyway, that's a, I don't know where that will go, but she's very serious on that. Um, there's a recruitment bill that Senator Linehan put in, LB 385. It's teacher recruitment and retention. Um, I think it's 5 or maybe that will be that's a, a bill she put in a positive bill she has uh, uh, another one it'll be 299 dealing with the bonds which you could do on your bonds and how you can how you can not do bonds let's put it that way um, it'll make it harder to pass a bond issue so I know the district has passed many bond issues. That's one we're going to keep a close eye on. She has one uh, LB 298 dyslexia bill. The reason I bring these up are these are people on the committee. So if you're on the committee, you have a better chance of getting your bill out. So this is kind of the ones that kind of caught my eye a little bit. Um, and then she has an alternative certification for teachers. Who could be a teacher who can't? Who, there's several of those bills out there that are out floating around on who's qualified to be a teacher and, and, you know, a veteran or something like that. They have that bill, too. So those are the curriculum bills that you want to pay close attention to. Opportunity scholarships has been around for, oh, gosh, 10 years probably. Last six, really heavy. There's 30 people that signed up on that bill, just so you know, on opportunity scholarships, which that's the big number of 30 sponsors. So that means they... It will probably get out of committee. It will, even if it doesn't get out of committee, which I can't see that not getting out of committee with the makeup of the committee, they could do a poll motion, and that will be dealt with this year. Um, so that's that's kind of an important one to watch. Senator Day put one in there, just so you know. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you talked about it earlier about your budget. Anyway, this one is everybody has to be paid the minimum wage, every employee. So that's one is fiscal issue. She has one on the Holocaust education grant. It's a grant, not a... So they passed that bill last year on Holocaust education. This would be several millions of dollars that you could apply for a grant to help pay for that. There's there's ones on civics. Um, another option, enrollment, Ben Hansen. Anyway, the ones I want to get to as well, and I'll wrap it up here and get, get an, off this subject. But Senator Merman, who's the chairman of the committee, he put in... Uh, a couple of bills to keep an eye on. Superintendent pay cap takes erodes local control. You know, superintendents get a lot of grief on, on these things, but it does erode your local control, what you could pay a superintendent, and that would be for, it's like five times the average teacher's salary or something like that. Um, he has one, LB 699, that caught my eye. It basically allows ag land to be valued at 0% for schools. Uh, the fiscal note on that bill is going to be astronomical but the fact that they wouldn't pay any property tax at all on farm ground is I don't know how that would work but anyway uh, there's another one um, part-time 372 is changes on part-time if you're going to participate in extracurricular activities within your district like a homeschooler or something like that they it would be easier to allow that the pushback against that has been well are they just doing it for the sports or the activities? And how do we know they're going to school and different things? You all know about that, but that's reintroduced. Um, and then the last one, uh, this one, Senator Merman, again, the chair of the committee, he introduced a bill which former chairman Mike Groney introduced about school discipline for some of the teachers, how you can handle the kids and all that. There's been pushback on that from a lot of different people, but part of that was some of, some of the special needs groups watch that one closely because they always feel, well, how are you going to deal with a special needs child 
differently. And, you know, so there's been some pushback on that. Uh, back that goes clear back to the Ernie Chambers days when Ernie was around. He'd always fought against that kind of thing because he's the one that got rid of that you could got rid of some of those issues. So anyway, that's just a few of these bills. So I just want to bring up those are the main ones that catch our eye that have been recurring or whatever. Um, what we're what we're looking at then is two things that they're going to do hearings starting next week on the morning and the afternoon. So. Education is only a two-day committee, and they had 90-some bills referenced to that committee. So they've got to work long nights to get these done because every bill has to have a hearing. For, for reference on that, the Natural Resources Committee, which is a three-day committee, only had 17 bills sent to Natural Resources. So they could be done in two weeks, whereas education only can meet on Tuesdays, Mondays and Tuesdays. They might be done in two months. So as we watch these bills, we then uh, talk to Dr. Rickley and Brett and kind of keep them up on here's what it is. They're scheduling bills out. They started today, actually. But they're scheduling bills out probably up to two weeks. So that's what they're doing today. We should have a good handle on what's coming the next two weeks, hopefully. But a lot of the legislative clerks and things are trying to get their bills scheduled. So what we'll do is how are they prioritized? I assume some of these ones I just talked to you about are going to be up early and being heard fairly early. So the governor's bills will probably be on there early. Um, just guessing from the makeup of the committee and the chairman, they, that's how they decide what bills go on. It's not like when you put it in or whatever. He could pick, he or she can pick whatever bill they want and have a hearing that day. So I'm expecting these to get out. Another thing to watch for is a lot of times a bill will get out um, of, of the committee. It may be adjusted with an amendment on the committee or whatever. What kind of concerns me this year, there's so many bills out there that they package them all together. So you may have one bill dealing with school finance, and there could be nine bills in there. So what we ask is, you know, we'll try to do our best to keep you – to keep – Dr. Rickley and others posted. You can see those bills, any questions you have. But to keep it posted, if you can talk to the senators, hopefully we're going to give you enough information. You can have an intelligent conversation with our senators and say, here's how it affects us. And I know there's different views of, on every school board all around the state on, on uh, controversial issues, whatever. Um, but like I say, we're going to give you enough information. You can, you'll know what's going on in that bill. And then any changes that happen. So the way we do that is we're on a program like a lot of other people. We just get the updates automatically come to us. So if anybody files any amendment to a bill, we see it come to the bill, and then every morning we get those. So it changes super quick. If I'm saying something tonight, um, a lot of times, you know, you make a spec. I hate to speculate too much on this legislative issues because it could change quickly. I just had a call coming here today completely changed the bill around for the better thank goodness but it can change really quickly and then so I never want to be um, you know I want to tell you here's what we know as of this date so we kind of I think we do put a date on these a little bit so um, bear with us on that um, other things that I might be missing and I can get to any questions uh, well it, we could just questions if you heard about some bills I'll tell you generally what I know or show you what I don't know We'll see. But today you heard about a lot of bills. Are there any things that, that we need to follow from you board members or caught your eye or concerns? Um, yeah, so I've been following these bills since they've been dropping, yeah. which is like a lot, as you know. Yeah, there's a lot, yeah. <laughs> um, I just I am a fan of um, Senator Merman, and he has dropped some great bills, um, as well as Senator Sanders. Um, the, uh, the LB374, which is a 16-page uh, bill, I mm -hmm. just highly encourage everybody, students, staff, parents, grandparents, taxpayers, to read it. Um, I was talking with some senators with that, and there actually is a hearing on January 31st. It's at 1.30 um, down at the Capitol. So that's the Adopt the Parents Bill of Rights and Academic Transparency Act, which is huge in... I mean, just briefly scanning over these as fast as I could today and then just the past week just getting um, these bills thrown at me. 
I just see like a pattern within these bills and a lot of it has to do with parents and transparency yeah, and parental yeah. involvement yep. consent um, which is huge um, running a campaign this whole entire spring summertime fall time that was the biggest thing on people's talking points I guess not just parents but teachers as well they have kids in school grandparents um, so yes I just highly encourage people to um, stay on top of this one and just really read all through it and then Sanders hers is LB 71 that's a four page one but that that LB 374 is a good one he's very um, his passion for the for teachers for students for parental control is huge and I feel like we all need parental control within no matter where you're at you know for your children because they're so innocent and we need to keep it that way thank you yeah yeah absolutely now that you bring that up there's multiple and you'll see it in there too and I, hopefully we did a good job too of explaining these bills and if you think sometimes you know it depends on who's reading them if, if you see any bias or anything in there, let us know. We're giving you what is introduced in these bills and trying to let you decipher what the opinions of the board are based on what I, what I was given. But, yeah, there are several bills like that. There will be more and more. There's, uh, like I said, I probably left out two-thirds just because of time interest tonight. But if you see anything and you want to bring it up, I think we should – we'll probably be here a little more this year just because of different things going on. Happy to do that. Um, and kind of bring it up but like I say I told you you know in December whenever we're here this big funnel and it just starts going like this and uh, it's a lot to cover I those those people I'll tell you what and I appreciate your service as school board members I know because you all put a lot of time into it too these state senators man they're they're uh, gonna put a lot of time into these hearings so and if you get there and like I say those are published too online of course and if you can go to the legislative website you can sign up for a daily update they do a pretty good job as far as generally keeping up not just on school issues but everything else so yeah thanks and, for, oh sorry marcus please go ahead yeah i was just going to talk about the senator merman bill i would push back a little bit just because it, it's a 16 page bill there's still more to be determined but you know that we talk about the local control being important. There's nothing more local than the local school board. We already have things in our policies and procedures about parent involvement and the way that 16 bill page bill is written. Um, it isn't a light burden for districts uh, to to stay on top of. So I think the the state school board association was was uh, technically a thumbs down against it, if I remember correctly and more to come on there but i think that's where it's important for us to talk to our state senators that you know they 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 speak local control but only when the those uh, localities are doing what they want the second that you know they think they have a better idea they want to push their agenda down then to uh the local government so um i think for us and for uh, the local school districts around here and in this area and across the state, I think, you know, I think we have uh, already things in place. There are already state laws regarding parental rights that um, I think would be just better uh, fit to keep going down that road. Uh, I also want to talk through the big one is the, the funding one that was announced. Uh, and I know that is still TBD as far as the district level, uh, you know, dollars go as far as who gets what. The big thing for the 1500 though, because that is the, the, the big thing where each, each child in public schools gets a minimum of $1,500 state support. Uh, if I'm correct, we are already past that 1500 right? Correct? So we correct. wouldn't get anything additional as far as that, that 1500 per kid goes, because we're already over that floor. But where we could be benefiting from getting the additional state dollars is the uh, special ed funding of up to 80%, which you said right now we're... 45 or 48 yeah, typically the state reimbursement rates hovers between 40 and 50 yeah. percent so that's where we could be seeing the benefit there but not on the the fifteen hundred dollar minimum yeah so again, and, like you said there are 100 ish bills and more to come on any of or on all of them as far as like the dollars uh yeah. so yeah it's uh, be just watching and out just, for it. yeah on that bill so you're right there's special special ed money in there and all that that was supposed to be funded at 100 percent or 90 percent way back in the day so it got down to whatever at 45 
So, yeah, the, the promises that are made aren't always kept by a legislature, right? So they go only two years at a time on the budget. We're flow, a wash in money right now. So this will be interesting. So but part of your priorities that I, is predictable and sustainable is two words that are in here that, that were drilled into our head. Like, okay, what's this going to do? So a lot of people are looking at, at that, like, that sounds great now. Now, if they do this trust fund, and I mean, the devil's in the details. So there could be some good opportunities for every school district being funded properly or whatever. Um, and so I say these things change a lot on deals cut and this and that and whatever the case may be. One thing I didn't bring up though, too, even though bills get out of these committees, you know, the way the makeup of the legislature is, is, and I hate to put it in Republican Democrat terms, but whatever, just there's different coalitions that get built up. The cloture vote did not change. There was a motion to change all these rules and they didn't do anything on that. So at the end of the day, they went in for two hours and probably could have been done in two minutes. Didn't change hardly anything on the rules. So the cloture motions, you still need to get 33 votes to get anything done. I'm expecting a lot of bills to get kicked out of committees and then a lot of debate and, and filibustering going on, just so you know. So none of these things are a done deal. Um, it's, it's more... Um, but there are a lot of good bills. Yeah, I would say a lot, but there are some good bills I think everybody likes. You know, I mean, if you can find the common ground. Uh, I, I think there's some bills in here that people will work together and get done. So I, I think the parental involvement things, they can narrow these down. That they, they become good bills if they work together. And there's some good people that are trying to work together. And, and I don't know if... Uh, so, you know, it, 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 you said something about Justin, you know, getting along. I think there are some good people came in because we have 17 new senators with some appointments and things. So there's some good people that we'll see how it goes. So um, anything else? I think in turn. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Holtmeyer, please. Um, I, I get the whole local control, but, like, we need parental control, and we do have policies set in place, but they're not always followed, and it just isn't a Papillion thing. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a whole district, like Omaha, everybody. So we just have to take into consideration, like, other districts that might need this bill as well when, um, I mean, parental control, that's all I got to say. It, it, they're the parent. Yeah. Thank you for being here tonight, Mr. Gay. Um, yep. Just in terms of community, so they're aware of kind of how we do business. Um, Mr. Richards and I have a weekly phone call with Mr. Gay where we go over kind of the latest happenings, which bills are hitting committee, what the progress is of those individual bills. In addition to those weekly meetings, uh, Mr. Gay will make at least typically one or two visits as much as the board uh, wants in terms of briefing him on, briefing the board on updates. Uh, and lastly, we're a member of the Greater Nebraska Schools Association. Their focus tends to be fairly narrow on uh, school matters that strictly relate to finance. doesn't deal with curriculum bills, for example. But that's another group that Mr. Richards and I are very active in. So we'll continue this conversation. But really, really appreciate this first stab at uh, giving us an overview of the bills. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right, next up under uh, item four uh, is uh, B, a staffing proposal 2023-2024. Uh, Dr. Settles. Yep. Hi, everybody again. So, yes, we do like to bring you annually some suggestions and recommendations for uh, as we look to staff for the following school year. Um, we begin this process well in advance of bringing this to you and do quite a lot of work on the backside of things to make sure that we're bringing um, good and strong recommendations to you. Uh, so just a couple of thoughts of what's have it's already been done. At the last meeting, you did hear the annual HR and student demographics report, uh, which all of that data certainly helps to inform these decisions. We also held meetings in the month of December with every school principal and talked about needs that they foresee, things that they wanted us to have on our radar. Um, as uh, Ms. Siri put it earlier today, it really does just become a gigantic puzzle to make sure that we're uh, utilizing everything in the most efficient way possible. We also um, 
in cabinet talked about a variety of different things looking at you know the greatest area of needs and then um, gave our recommendations and set some goals in moving forward with this and then throughout all of this time we've had ongoing discussion with our HR subcommittee members so the goals for this year are, um, as Ms. Fisher pointed out, managing staffing with the growing needs as well as all along maintaining those effective class sizes. That is something that we watch um, on a daily and certainly on a at minimum weekly basis all throughout the school year. Uh, but definitely there are certain times of the year that we're looking at that every single day, especially at the elementary level as uh, just a couple of move-ins or move-outs can change some things there. Uh, we also always just want to be very mindful of the overall budget and the impacts that we know this can have on uh, the overall budget. So coming to you with a a pretty small ask compared to what you've seen in some past years. Really, we've gotten a lot, uh, we've gotten ourselves into a very good spot. So, um, especially as we utilize some pre planning with um, some of the ESSER dollars in the area of special education and such. So, uh, you're going to see a lot smaller ask than typical. Uh, at the elementary level, Typically what I will do is take a look at what the predicted class sizes are for the following year. Uh, and our principals know this very well. Sometimes they'll have a class size that they're going, or they'll go down a section or two um, in their building and we'll shuffle those around to other areas of the district. Um, we are in a spot where at the elementary level, we do need to ask for one elementary classroom teacher. Um, that has been as we have grown Ashbury. Uh, we have added sections, um, I think, very diligently as needed um, as that area begins to fill in. So um, there's an addition of a classroom teacher there. We also have previously staffed our counselor at Ashbury at a half-time counselor position, and next year we will be in a spot where we need to grow that to the full-time and um, We've been very creative with it, but it definitely is time that we need to do that. Um, for the elementary specials, our art team um, does cover multiple buildings. We've got several of them covering three buildings and then the majority of them covering uh, two schools. We are at the point that we need to add a .6 elementary art in order to be able to cover each of the sections. So you'll see that in there. Um, I'm going to jump down real quick onto the growth piece. I also uh, want to, you to know that we're watching the elementary specials as a whole as when we do need to add a section or do some shuffling around, there sometimes are needs for me to ask for a very small amount from you, a point one, a point two, a point three of that growth. Um, I don't know yet that we're going to be needing that, but that's an area that I'm really watching closely. So um, that could be something you hear from us in the future. At Liberty, um, this is one we've been watching for the last couple of years, and we are in a spot where um, we're recommending adding the assistant principal at this point. Uh, Liberty functions with all of the same programs, all of the same uh, needs and offices and reports and everything that we need in each of our other two middle schools. And uh, they are at a point where we are now recommending um, the full-time assistant principal. We've been able to get by there with um, some very strong um, lead teachers who have served in half time. We have uh, somebody this year as well as somebody in the last couple of years who has served in a half-time lead teacher position and so we are um, now suggesting that that lead teacher position goes away and it becomes a full-time assistant principal. Um, we ha are also asking for a half-time technology facilitator position. This is somebody that we currently uh, share a full 1.0 position um, on an ESU3 contract, our portion of that would be adding the 0.5. Um, again, we try not to use the growth, but we do ask you to approve growth in, if in fact we have um, some more pressing needs that come up throughout the year. So we're asking for uh, 2.0 FTE in special education and 5.0 in general education. 
if that's something that we need to dip into, typically I'll talk with subcommittee about that first, and then I'll make the recommendation to the rest of the board uh, that we go ahead and do that. But again, that's something that we've been very cautious about using. I think in 2020, 2021, we actually used all of the growth. Um, that's the only time I can think of that happening um, in the last several years as we're usually really careful and you might see us use just a tiny portion of that. What question? Oh, let me, <laughs> our next steps, and I'll answer questions that you might have. Um, but we always want to be keeping aware of the teacher shortage as well. Um, we have been looking at the areas that we're designating as those high needs and shortage positions. We will want to move quickly on this. Uh, we will, we're bringing this to you tonight. We'll ask you to take action on it at the February 13th meeting, and then we'll post those uh, 3.6 positions and start to work on that on the next day on February 14th. Um, the majority of our hiring is done in January, February, March. It starts to slow down a little bit in April and May, and certainly we hope to have most everybody hired and filled by the time we get to summer. Um, we'll continue to watch those class sizes. I feel really good about where it's at uh, right now and where we're looking for them to all be for next year, but we'll keep an eye on that and um, be mindful of utilizing any growth. What questions might you have? This is one of the smallest asks I've seen in a long time. Um, but I trust, you know, that having worked with you in the department, that you all have looked at it very closely with the principals and everyone to know that that's what we need. But I do appreciate you putting in those growth positions so that we have the availability, should we need it, to use that. Um, it is rare that we do use all of them, but we generally always have to use a few here and there. So I do like that you've included those in there to be sure that we have the availability to move forward with that if we need to. So um, I thought it was a really good recommendation for this evening. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Settles. Thanks, Appreciate Dr. it. Settles. Our next item, item C, uh, request for purchase uh, for the uh, wide area network. Lucas. Good evening, board. Uh, in front of you is a discussion item for this evening. Uh, it is a draft copy of our uh, intended uh, request for proposals that we will be putting out uh, for bid here this week. Um, the document is uh, uh, similar to, uh, excuse me, has a couple of options for the district uh, to uh, bid out a contract for what uh, connects our buildings uh, network-wise. So the, ma the majority of our facilities are connected with a fiber optic network backbone. Um, typically in urban areas, that's something you lease, uh, just with all the uh, facilities and maintenance and, and things like that required with ongoing operation of it. Uh, the existing contract we have is with a vendor uh, called Unite Private Networks, which is now been merged with Cox Communications, uh, and it is it was a 10-year contract and is up in December of this year. Uh, so in order to meet uh, E-rate timing, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but also to allow prospective uh, contractors enough time to do construction if, if construction were to be needed to provide us this service, uh, that's the reason why we bring it so early and get it out on the streets, so to speak, uh, to give them that opportunity. Um, we will be intending to file E-rate on this. Uh, E-rate is a federal program under the Federal Communications Commission that provides um, basically subsidies for this type of service. Um, we take those in the form of bill discounts, so it's not something that we pay out and get reimbursed for. It's something that uh, the vendor is responsible for giving us a discount on as uh, long as we properly file, which um, we've been successful in doing. So uh, the, the intent would be to post this this week, uh, have it out for the required time window um, for the E-rate regulations, and then come back to the board at the first meeting in March um, with a, a recommendation to execute a contract with a vendor. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. What, what is our E-rate discount? Yeah, we're a 50% discount district. 50? Yep. So what, because the E-rate used to be my expertise yeah. um, that means we get 50% off of the bill that we get for eligible services that we yeah. pay for um, e-rate also requires that these bids have to go out on a regular basis 
so that funding can be reviewed and that you're always getting the lowest price possible on these services on meeting your needs. So it's a it's an excellent program, I think, because as long as you do your proper bidding and everything, and this is a really good bid. I know you've been working with a, another state expert on bid writing, yeah. so it's, it's really We're very well fortunate to yeah. so have just great help meet there. your deadlines. Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ms. Witt does bring up a good point. Uh, the existing contract that we had did have a clause for extension uh, for two five-year periods, um, as we discussed and felt, uh, both meeting probably um, uh, board policy and processes and also just being uh, mindful of our taxpayer dollars, uh, making sure we go out for bid for competitive um, responses this time around and not executing the option to extend that contract is where we're at. Um, a lot of things have changed in 10 years. 10 years ago, there wasn't nearly the amount of competition and fiber in the ground, uh, subterranean and also aerial on telephone poles and such that you see now. Uh, so I anticipate we'll have some good interest in this and uh, hopefully that leads to also good competition and uh, some some good prices for us to consider as well. Just as an example for um, one of the things that this bidding process has done through the E-rate program is uh, because you do do internet through the state yeah. internet service. Yeah. We used to pay something like $15 a megabit for internet and it's down to what now like 15 yeah, cents? Yeah, it's less than a dollar. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like 15 cents and then after discounts it's even yeah. half of that. So it's it's really a good deal. All right, any further comments, questions? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it, Lucas. Thanks, Lucas. All right, uh, item D, uh, facility needs community engagement update. Ms. Iman. So I'm going to be really quick tonight because um, most of this data you've seen, but um, we just wanted to update you on where we are with the whole community engagement process. Um, I know you've seen this a lot, but the big chunk that we still do not have done yet or that we're close to being having done is that phone survey. So I wanted to update you on where we are with that process. Um, we did um, hire an outside survey company, Morris Leatherman Company. It's actually out of Minnesota. Um, they came very highly recommended by many people that I know very well and trust in the industry. Um, they're doing phone surveys. In fact, they completed the phone calls last week. Did anybody get called? Um, they completed the phone um, calls last week. The sample size was 650, which is significantly harder, higher than um, a sample size that we've used in the past. Um, traditionally, you need about 400 surveys to be statistically valid representation of your community. But because this um, particular company specializes in some cross tabs and stuff, they wanted the higher number to make sure that they had validity in all of their smaller subsets as well. Um, they are focusing on registered voters. That's one of the screening questions that they ask at the very beginning of the survey. Um, I've also asked them to make certain that 60% of the individuals that answer the survey do not have children in our schools, just so that represents, I mean, it doesn't represent exactly, but comes close to representing um, the makeup of our community. Um, they are going to have, like I said, the calls were completed last week. Um, on Friday, actually, he emailed me Saturday morning and said they were done, so I don't know if they were done Friday or Saturday. Um, but they were completed last week. They're using this week to put together the data analysis. Um, they will present the preliminary data um, to all of you at the January 30th retreat. And then we'll do a more formal presentation at the February 13th board meeting. The focus of the survey is really just perceptions and attitudes of the registered voters in our community. Um, they want to know whether the perceptions of, we're asking about the perceptions of our school district and of education in general. Um, ratings, so they're doing like a level of support in each of the different projects that we have in the bond issue to help us flag if there's any projects that potentially would hurt this bond issue or really help the bond issue. Um, they're looking at the overall support of the proposal, so you have that information as a board as you um, make final decisions about moving forward. There are also, there's some questions in there which I love about communications, just where do people get their information? Where do they prefer to get their information? 
Um, and then, of course, there's a whole series of demographic type questions, which will help them with the cross tabs when they present that data to us. Next steps, really, um, so all of you are aware of our timeline here. Um, we'll go through that survey data January 30th and February 13th. Um, we'll have to finalize that project list by the February 15th, 13th board meeting. Um, if you all make the decision to proceed, um, we need to start discussing ballot language um, and what that's going to look like at the February 13th or the February 27th meeting um, and formal action. So we, if you think of two meetings, it has to be discussed and then action, formal action has to be done by that March 13th meeting. And that gives us about a day to get it to filed with the election commissioner. So that's really a quick turnaround. Um, if there's any way you could do it by the 27th, I think that would be better. But we do have till March 13th is the absolute last day um, that the board can take action and we can file it if you want an election in May. If you want the election in June or July or some other time, then, then that March 13th date is not as critical. Questions? Told you I'd be quick. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Are you on? Okay. Uh, can you repeat that 400 survey? What about the 400 survey? That's how you, you can read a good. The 400 survey sample, of, so for a universe size that's our size, generally speaking, once your, your size of your community gets to a certain level, 400 is statistically valid. So the 400 surveys would be statistically valid representation of our community, um, which, and it's a 95% confidence level, plus or minus five. So if you did the survey over and over again, you'd get the same results with a different sample. So that's what that 400 number is. Okay, so are, are, are we taking that uh, 400 number from like the phone surveys, um, the surveys that people filled out at no. the bottom, or no? Okay. Mm -mm. This Sorry, is confused. this survey is just the phone survey. Oh, okay. So the previous survey that we information that we've collected has all been qualitative survey. It hasn't though we did have the ratings, which would be a little bit more quantitative. Um, this survey is a formal, what they call a formal survey, which means it'll be a statistically valid representation of our community that tells us exactly percentages, numbers, and statistics on how many people feel in what particular direction about the proposal. So it's, it's another piece of the whole pie, but it's a very different piece. 400 is the minimum, though. You said this survey is 650, right? And 650 is yeah, what so they're targeting. Yeah, so we're way above the minimum, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah and we've, I went back and looked because I was just curious. It, we had several survey companies that bid this and were worried about getting 400. Um, and I went back and looked. I think the lowest number we've ever had on a survey was 385. Um, there was one year when it was completed that we were, we didn't hit that 400 target. It's, phone surveys are a challenge right now. Um, people have cell phones, but you can buy lists of cell phones, which that's what this company does. Um, so you can purchase lists of cell phones, but people don't answer. They don't answer their cell phone number if they don't know who's calling. Um, we did try to do a lot of front loading with our community that said the survey's coming, make sure you answer it. We sent it out to parents several times. We even did some paid advertising um, on social media for our zip codes to give people the heads up that these surveys are coming and we need people to answer them. But he said they completed them, so I'm assuming they hit that 650 number. I did have one quick question. You mentioned 60-40 um, split between non-parents -parent, and parents, and you said you asked, they ask them about each project and if they support those projects. Do they explain what those projects are? Because I'm assuming that there's probably a significant number of people that aren't don't have kids in the district that probably don't understand or, or know what some of these projects are. Yeah, we worked a lot on the verbiage of the, of the wording of each of those. We went back and forth. Um, that's the one thing I really liked about this company. I felt really confident that the questions they were asking were not skewing the voter or the answer in one way or the other. Um, so there's not a ton of description, um, but it broke out each, I want to say there were 10 or, do you remember, Brett? I think there were 10 or 11 different things that we had broken out, um, and it gave enough of a description that they could tell us their feelings. I think one of the things that's really important about um, surveys and data is that people generally don't vote on 
a lot of facts. They vote on the emotions. So, so really what you're looking for is what triggers emotions um, with particular projects one way or the other for or against that particular area. Great question. Um, for the phone verbiage, is there any way to get like a transcript of what is being said to them? I didn't get a phone call, but yeah, that will all be presented when they present the data. Okay, okay. When they give you the data, they'll give you all the questions and and they'll present all of that. Yep. Okay. Great question. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Thank you very much. I think you're just going to stay, right? Aren't you next I'm just as well? Stay. That's you don't what mind. I thought. <laughs> Not at all. No. The next one, last one, uh, item E, policy 1000, public relations communications. Okay, and I will whip through these um, pretty quick, actually. Um, you know, it's primarily policy that you guys are responsible for, but I did include some of the procedural changes so you could see what they were as we review this whole um, 1000 series. I do think those of you that submitted um, suggestions to this, it was super helpful. The first policy, the um, 1001 non discrimination, um, I apologize that you didn't have this until tonight. Um, but we did add our non-discrimination statement um, into the procedure of this, um, which isn't something you need to take action, but we just felt that it was really important. It wasn't specific that this is what our non-discrimination statement, it didn't say that anywhere in policy and there were no procedures to go with this, so we added that in. Um, and the reason it took a while, because I was working with the attorney on that, and she thought that was a great idea to make it very clear. So we had it clearly outlined in procedure um, what our non-discrimination policy was. Moving on, um, 1101, goals of communication. I just made a little tweak there, um, really to match our practice, that, that um, things don't go directly to the to the board agenda, but they go through a subcommittee. So I just added that um, phrase in there. 1102 district communication. I felt like when I read through this policy, it was not very strong. And I felt that we needed some more, um, some stronger language in it to really clarify philosophically what we believe and what we've always functioned as, as a school district and a board. Um, so I added some of that, la that language of, um, Base, our communication be based on transparency and two-way communication, some of the things that we value. So it was really just cleaning up some wording and trying to make things flow a little bit easier. 1407, um, political activities. This will hit a button with all of us. Um, we did, I did add in the social media accounts. Um, we did have that one issue. Um, but more importantly, it's just keeping up with the times. You know, that's how people are doing political communication, support this person, support that person. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that was included in our policy as well. 1408 advertising, I didn't have any changes in the policy and there were really just some, just some logistical changes in the procedure, just cleaning up some wording um, to match the practices that we currently do. 1409 fundraising, again, a very minor policy changes, just cleaning up some wording in that and same way with the procedural stuff, um, really just cleaning up the, the wording to match our current practices. The special projects fundraising um, was next. That was a policy change. This was an issue that actually came up and, and um, a couple months ago, and we decided that it was, the wording in the policy maybe was not super clear. Um, so I wanted to clarify that as a part of the special project or fundraising activities, naming rights needed to be approved through the Board of Education. Um, and it was those special projects and fundraising. So we added that. Um, just as a clarification, it, again, goes in line with what we actually do as practice, but the wording I didn't think was very clear. Um, and then just some very logistical stuff in those procedures. I will say, and it's not in there, 1501, which is the facilities um, policy, we are updating. Actually, Marcus, I think you sent this suggestion, and I sent it out to our ADs and our principals. We are looking at the pricing that we're currently charging for that facility use. We do not charge many people at all. For the most part, it's the people that fall under that nonprofit and they get it for free, but there are some charges. And the other thing that our athletic directors and principals identified was that 
we have some spaces that are used by some groups that are charged that are not identified in the policy. So we're cleaning up that procedural and I'll push that out to you as soon as we get that done. And then the last one is 1702, which is memorials. Um, I included all the changes. Um, uh, Dr. Myers and Dr. Steele and I sat down and restructured the memorial policy. Um, we had a lot of samples, really looked at best practice. Um, we had a memorial policy. It was okay, but it wasn't super clean. And so we looked at what is best practice, what are other samples and models. We really targeted this off of um, what the National School Psychs Association recommends as far as memorial policies and how to use them and what best practice is for memorials. And then we incorporated all of those um, into that procedure of how we're doing it. Questions? Uh, the ones that are listed in this packet, are these the only ones that we're going over to be like um, revising or is yeah, it the, everything? The only exception to that, Brittany, would be the um, non-discrimination, which was not included in the original packet, but I think Kathy passed it out mm -hmm. to okay. you at the beginning of the meeting. And that is not a policy, it's just a procedure. Oh, okay. Sorry, because I was I misunderstood that then. Because I printed off all the policies in the Series 1000, so I was editing... If I'm editing and I'm, if I want to maybe like correct something, who do I send it to? Just send it to me. Oh, yep. okay. If you've still got suggestions, that's why we bring these as a discussion. Okay. If you still have suggestions, we can bring them back and make those changes. So if you've got suggestions in these, these were the only ones that I, we looked at the whole 1,000 series. Oh, okay. These were the only policies that I identified changes for. But if you have other suggestions that you want us to consider, just send them to me and we can do that. Okay, within the whole series, not yep, just Yep, within the okay. whole series. Got it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, anything else? All right. Thank you, Ms. Simon. I appreciate it. All right, and that's the end of uh, Section 4. So Section 5, the future board calendar. Uh, i got a couple liaison lunches here. January 24th, 2023, Parkview Heights with Ms. Witt. Uh, January 30th, uh, Walnut Creek, uh, myself. And then we do have our uh, board retreat. Uh, it'll be here at the central office at uh, 4 p.m. on January 30th. And then another liaison lunch, February 3rd, uh, Plain La Vista South High School with Mr. Madler. And on the 10th, uh, Hickory Hill with Ms. Fisher. And on, also on February 10th, uh, no school for the elementary only, staff development day. And finally, our next uh, Board of Education meeting on uh, February 13th here in the central office at 6 p.m. So anything else any, uh, to be brought before the board? All right, then I will adjourn this meeting at 7.52 p.m. Thank you very much.